Is the dead cat dead? And by dead cat, I mean the dead cat bounce in the global economy because all signs are pointing toward more acceleration to the downside. We had an initial slowdown in 2022 predicated on consumer prices and producer prices going crazy, which brought the economy to a standstill. But in bringing the economy to a standstill around the world, it unleashed disinflation as well as a little bit of positive sentiment and a little bit of rebound, sprinkle a little bit of China reopening because it was only a little bit, and suddenly you've got the dead cat bounce. So downturn in 2022, early 2023, things look a little bit better. Europe is coming back, sentiment's rising, China's reopening, the U.S. labor market, well, it's always strong somewhere. And it's so 2023 looked a little bit better, but as we move into the summer and really the fall and autumn, it's falling again, as we can see in data around much of the world. It's not just China and its struggles with yuan. There's a whole bunch of statistics out there that suggest the dead cat is itself dead. Steve, Mr. Van Meter, where should we start? I was thinking we could talk about Japan a little bit because Japan is very close to China. And I know you know this. They just reported their leading economic indicator for the month of July, and it's pointing down again. It's following the pattern that I just laid out here, the dead cat bounce. And at 107.6 for July, that's now the lowest since 2020. So we had a little bit of a steady part of the early part of the year, a little bit of a pickup around March and April, and then, uh-oh, right back over again. Yeah, Jeff, and some of this we can also explain due to seasonality. We have you know, the back-to-school season. We have wholesalers and retailers do stock up ahead of time for the holiday season. So I know a lot of people order online and they get it you know, within a matter of days. Well, if you're stocking up for, say, Thanksgiving and Christmas, you, you don't wait for a couple weeks before. This is something that's done a long time ahead. So the notion that we'd see a bit of revival in the factory sector here around the world is really not surprising. We've seen a, you know, a hiccup in global shipping a little bit. The problem I have, Jeff, is it's the enthusiasm around it as if like, hey, you know what? The bottom is in. We're going to be OK. It's like, look, just because you manufacture this stuff and you ship this stuff, someone's got to buy all of this stuff. And we've already got massive inventory levels, as you've covered you know, over the last couple of years. So the question is, are American consumers and consumers around the world going to buy all this stuff or is it just going to get added to the giant pile of inventory that's going to lead to, as of course, the dead cat suggests more disinflation and deflation until eventually everything is worked out. And we have to add the Japanese consumers onto your list here. It's not just American consumers or European consumers. It's almost like degrees of the same problems. The, the worst shape right now has to be European consumers. Uh, U.S. consumers are questionable at best, and that's really starting to turn around. And Japanese, the Japanese were supposed to be the one shining example out of all the major economies because their consumer price index moved later than everyone else's. And everybody presumes if CPIs are high, that must mean that economic activity is robust. And so it looks like Japan entered 2023 on a determined upswing. But as this leading economic indicator and some of the recent statistics, including the GDP report that was a blowout 6% quarter, which has been revised down a little bit, which actually showed major weakness in the household sector, household spending and incomes are just absolutely horrible and going the opposite way. What we're seeing, Steve, is globally synchronized yet again. So we had the debt CAD bounce and accelerating to the downside, which includes Europe, it includes Japan, it includes the United States, as we'll see in just a minute. And Leading the charge on the downside are the Chinese, who are having all sorts of problems with everything from their currency, the monetary system, the economy, and maybe even the top level political <laughs> political levels, um, whatever's going on with Xi and the elders there. So we look around the global economy. The dead cat made its best effort. It slammed the ground really hard, not to torture this analogy many more than we have to. It slammed the ground really hard and it got a little bit off, not all that high. And I think that's playing a role in this too. The, the spring and early summer rebound wasn't as much as many people were hoping. We see that certainly in European GDP. And now we're facing summer and fall where we don't have as much bounce. And as you said, a whole bunch of seasonal factors are beginning to work and conspire against the global economy. So acceleration to the downside here, is that what we're looking at? 
Yeah, Jeff, I think that's the case, for, uh, at least when I look at the global economy and look at the data is we saw, like you said, we saw a little bounce up here. The problem is there was just way too much enthusiasm in it, but there's lack of follow through. And that's really what you want to see here. Sure, we can look at the U.S. data and say, well, employers aren't laying off as many people, but we've made the case that they just trained a whole bunch of them and they're really apprehensive. They just don't want to let them go and go through the cycle again. The problem always comes back to if we don't see demand increase, then it tells us that, of course, that at some point employers are going to lay off here. And we as we look back, we're just not seeing the demand. You know, new order growth is still slowing. The, the, the trend is still to the downside, even though the ball is bouncing a little bit. It's just not bouncing that much. And that's what you want to see is these big rebounds where it shows some sustainability or momentum. You don't want to see it kind of roll over and head down. And that's the problem, Jeff, because you look around the world, who's going to drive consumption? Is it the U.S. consumer? Well, they're looking like they've got some headwinds. Is it European consumer? Probably not. We know the Chinese consumer. Well, they're not because everyone was hoping they were, and that turned out to be a dud. So who's going to drive the change here? I, I'm not sure. Steve, isn't there a little bit more of a concern this year, too, compared to last year? What I mean by that is last year what was driving the downturn was relentless consumer prices or what seemed and what felt like relentless consumer prices so prices on necessities went way up and people went i gotta start cutting back but that had a sort of positive aspect to it and i don't want to make too much out of that is it wasn't really positive for the general economy but for a lot of businesses what they saw was their volume growth declined their growth declined and even volume started to decline so they were selling less than they thought they were in some cases they were selling less goods and less services but prices were rising more than enough to offset it so they said you know you know i'm selling less stuff less services but my revenues are largely still expanding they're not as good as they were but they're still growing that provides the economy a nominal cushion it definitely provides workers a nominal cushion because Companies are not under top line pressure to start really getting rid of people. This year, everything has flipped around. Now we have volume growth that has gotten even worse, but in this disinflationary transition, there's no longer the top line or nominal growth. And that's what we see in a lot of the economic statistics. You look at the real numbers, volumes are bad. You look at nominal stuff, they're still high, but they're coming down too, which means we're leading to a point where this year, unlike last year, these companies around the world, they're selling less stuff, but now they no longer have prices and nominal growth to make up for it, which means this is a very different, uh, This the other side of this particular dead cat bounce is not the same as when the, the, the cat was still alive and before it bounced. Yeah, that's right, Jeff, because when you look at the government data, the nominal, or for those who don't understand what we're referring to, the non-inflation adjusted data, well, it looks really good. I mean, you just kind of have to sit back and be like, well, the numbers keep going up. But when, as you said, when you look at transactions or volume of what's actually selling, it's going down. And I've been making the case that due to inflation, a lot of these retailers, they didn't, they didn't not realize it on the onset, but they're getting screwed here. And at some point, they're going to figure it out. And I think they're starting to get to that point. And then the only thing they have left, because you, you look at the effects of inflation, Jeff, and you've, you've made the case over and over, look, things will, there will be some deflation, there will be some disinflation, but certain things aren't going down. Your landlord's not going to call you and say, hey, you know what? I think I raised your rent too much, right? The car insurance rates are not going to come back down. Maybe a tiny bit, but there, there's certain things that don't come down. So if you look at this as a business perspective and you're starting to figure out that, hey, my volumes are going down as prices go up, there's only one solution or one eventual solution is you got to cut manpower. Yeah, that's pretty much where we're going here. What we're, what we're implying with all our feline analogies is that, this one, you know, the, the cat bought us some time here. The nominal expansion bought us some time here. The labor hoarding that Steve just mentioned, that bought us a lot of time here because companies have been reluctant and really hoarding labor this cycle, unlike any other cycle. And you have all of these temporary factors that have stretched and elongated this business cycle longer than, longer than normal. Assuming there is normal, there isn't really a normal. But essentially, now that we're getting to the point where all of these start to fade in their in their effect, especially that nominal one, as nominal economy starts to turn over too, that really brings up the dangers. And then you multiply it with all the other financial and monetary issues that we're experiencing. 
starting with China, but not just China. And it gets to be, you know, wish for the days when the the, the cat was just about ready to, to bounce here because nominal growth slows down, volumes. What we're really saying is that the entire global economy is going to have to revert to its volumes, not the nominal, it's volumes. And that's and it's kind of a tricky issue because Steve and I were talking before we started recording here that everybody convinced themselves that in 2021, the good times, the nominal good times, the prices, that was going to be the future forever and I. And now they have to adjust to a very different set of circumstances. Yeah, Jeff, we could call this almost a lottery effect, right? You could take someone and say, here, I'm going to give you $100,000. You won the lottery. And for a while, it will just appear that they have money coming out of their, their ears. It's just everywhere. They're buying things, spending it. But what happens when they run out of money? There's that adjustment right back down. And yet what baffles me is we just shove all this money into the global economy. We take on massive amounts of debt to do it. We stuff the global economy full of all this money. And then we get excited and say, look, this is a new normal. And yet what are we seeing now? We're hearing from the Fed that around somewhere at the end of the third quarter or very shortly, that the pandemic money is gone. We look at the credit data and what do we see? Not only are banks tightening lending standards, but even if they weren't, consumers have looks like they've maxed out their credit cards. So you've got, you know, we could throw away all the other factors here and say, look, if the, if everyone's run out of money and run out of the ability to spend on a lifestyle that they can't afford anymore, there's got to be an adjustment. The problem is, as you just said, we have adjust down from these pandemic volumes. And when you start to put that into perspective, it's quite scary. Let's talk about Europe, because Europe is probably the most advanced in, in terms of this reverting to the volume or reverting to the real state of the economy. Eurostat just reported this week revisions to their second quarter GDP numbers, which basically show the gross domestic product in real terms, so therefore volume of output of goods and services across the entire euro area, which is 19 countries of the eurozone, has been flat for three quarters running. There's really hasn't been any bounce. So there was a little bit of a downturn in the fourth quarter of last year. Of course, that was when curves told us things were going wrong. We had inversions in Germany, major inversions in treasuries, inversions in forward money curves. And lo and behold, we find out that the European economy, at least, fell into a small, mod, very shallow, modest downturn and then has failed to get out of it just as the curves had told us and forewarned us. But as the, what we're talking about here, and as Steve just said, as Europe skirts around in recession already for three quarters of a year, all the forward indications, including the curves, are telling us that's just the opening phase of this reversion process. And what's ahead of us is not recovery, because if we were going to get the recovery, if we're going to get more than a dead cat bounce, that would have been the first and second quarter of this year. But instead, the entire European economy just stayed flat, which is a contraction. And now we're looking at the dead cat coming back down, acceleration to the downside, deceleration in the nominal parts of the economy, less prices, more disinflation, which is actually the bad thing. That's what we've been saying all along. Go back to any of our shows over the last year. Disinflation while welcome, is not going to be a good thing. It's not a good sign. It's a sign of we're going back to where the fundamentals of the overall economy are. And we see that in European GDP, which, as Steve said, that's it's not a good look. But Europe is not just, it's not just Europe. It's Europe is the, the, the farthest along in this process. Yeah, Jeff. And one thing I, I really find interesting in the data lately is the German manufacturing PMIs. And and the reason, you know, and I know you've read them and looked at them, but was, what I find so fascinating is we see the levels in, in the German manufacturing sector drop to, well, we'll just say kind of a recession or financial crisis lows. And everyone said, oh, look, maybe they're going to bounce a little bit. And of course, you know, we know these PMIs are noisy and they don't go in a straight line, but it bounced a little bit. And it was like, OK, see, look, that means the bottom is in. It's like, but what if the bottom isn't in? And we actually do see a rollover here. We've got a lot way further to go down. And then you start reading the, the reports because a lot of people look at the headline numbers and form their opinion. But you start reading this as new order growth, lower, you know, backlogs almost work through. You labor, boy, we're getting kind of tired of having to stand around and do nothing. You start looking at those reports and you go like, wait a minute here. 
if this, if what's going on in Germany, and then which we know is going to flow out to the rest of the Eurozone, if this is just an example of what is coming, well, the dead cap bounce hasn't gotten to the US yet. It fully hasn't gotten to China yet. But when it does, watch out below. And it's not just the PMIs either. Uh, as you know, Steve, the, the hard data has confirmed exactly that. We look at industrial production in Germany, which just came out this week too. It has been down three months running again. So same pattern that we've been talking about here in Germany as Japan, and to an extent the U.S., we had a slowdown, a downturn, a initial part of the recession last year, early part of this year, but then it looked like everything was getting better again. We had China reopening, we had disinflation, but now summer, late spring into summer, industrial production in Germany, the PMIs, the services numbers around the world, including the United States, they're moving back lower again. So we had our run of optimism, and as Steve said, there wasn't a whole lot of momentum. In fact, it was really disappointing. And the most disappointing of all has to have been China reopening. So we ask ourselves, if we're going to avoid the recession that looks more and more imminent, how is that? How where is the source of strength going to come from? And what we're left with is really hoping that the U.S. labor market is as good as maybe some people are interpreting from what to us is, as we talked about last week, really questionable and weak data to begin with. So if we're if we're putting our hopes on the payroll report we really don't have a whole lot left here. No, it, right, because it comes back to the hope of the services sector, which, which Jeff, I, I, it baffles me every time because it's like, okay, manufacturing's in a slump in the U.S., no big deal, the services sector. So you mean these part-time, low-wage jobs are somehow going to mythically pull these high-skilled, high-wage workers' income you know, back up? No, 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 no. It's not how it works. Where, where manufacturing goes, the other follows. Everyone said, no, you guys are wrong. This time it's completely different, which, of course, we love it when people say that. But sure enough, we're seeing this deceleration in the services sector. As we know, uh, I go out and put some feet on the ground around the parks around here from time to time. And I can tell you, Jeff, I was at the I was a Typhoon Lagoon. Surprisingly, just the other day, I was there, of course, every day, as everyone knows. And this, here's what the staff told me, Jeff. This is surprising. They said, after Labor Day, it's dropped off so much that the full-time staff said, if this is an indication of where we're going into the winter, we're in big trouble because it's never dropped off this much. And my answer was, there people are out of money. And they said, how do you know? I said, look around. They're not here spending it. And sure enough, I think that is just what we're seeing as the beginning of what is going to come to the end of the year for the U.S. economy. That's a great way to leave it. We'll leave it on the latest update of the Steve Van Meter Disney Park <laughs> Attendance PMI, proprietary trademarked to Eurodollar <laughs> University. Thanks as always, Steve. See you again next week. You're at, <laughs> you're, oh, there we go. Okay. You ready? <clears throat> Let's do it. <clears throat> Clear your throat. <clears> throat> <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to put that at the end of the show? Clear your throat. <laughs> Here's our exercises of what we do. All right, stretch.